All right, brethren, we're going to begin in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and our text will be in uh, verses 4 and 5, but I'm going to read the first five verses, 1 Peter 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So, the last time we met in our last, last week, we saw how the Lord's people lay aside the works of the flesh there that are listed in verse 1. And that is by the power of Christ our Savior, <clears throat> giving us a new heart and a new spirit that desires to walk with the Lord and, and looking to Him and trusting in His works and not our own works. So that we leave behind those works of the flesh that we were under when we were under the law of sin and of bondage just under the dominion of those things and under the dominion of the works of the flesh. But God the Father comes and He gives us life, He gives us the Spirit, He washes us in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we're cleansed from our sins in the blood of Christ, our Savior, and we're taught of God that we might know Him, be settled in Christ, and grow in Christ. And so the believer comes to God the Father not in their own works of righteousness, not looking to the things that they do or don't do or what they have done. They're looking to Christ and they're resting in Him and they're trusting in Christ because that's how God accepts us. He accepts us in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. We come offering, not our works, but we come offering the blood of Christ. That is, we trust in the blood of Christ knowing that that's why Christ came to put away our sins. So we don't look to anything that we do. Our title is Coming to Christ, and we'll have two divisions, why we come to Christ and how we come to Christ. All right, so our first point, why we come to Christ. When we were under the dominion of sin and Satan, we depended on those works of flesh, right? Malice, guile, hypocrisy, the envy, the evil speaking, right? Because the law, at that time when we were in our flesh, the law had something to say to us, right? And the law demands a perfect righteousness. It demands perfect righteousness from us. And we must give it in order to be accepted by God. So when we were under that dominion, we realized quickly we can't do these things. We can't do these things perfectly. So in our flesh we turn to the natural works, the guile and hypocrisy and malice all kinds of craft and things like that, that we might convince ourselves and convince others that we did know God. We might have some sort of feeling of satisfaction and acceptance with God by trusting in those, those works. Right? It's like that, that story you hear of two men coming upon a bear, and they're both trying to run from the bear, and one says, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. Right? And so that's how we are in the flesh. We're just looking to outrun other people so that we might appear better and convince ourselves that, yeah, I guess I guess I am a Christian because I'm doing better than that guy over there. Those are the things that we look to. And even now, I'm sure it's, it's here, maybe in different ways or in different amounts, but up north, northeast, you see how people hate God. They put God out of their mind and out of their thoughts. As Paul said to the Romans, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So that now we find ourselves living in those last times, those last days, which Paul called perilous times, where men and women are just outward and bold in their sin and their hatred of God and doing that which pleases their own flesh. They don't even think about the things that at one time they maybe would have had shame over because they just put God out of their mind and they don't they don't think about the Lord anymore 
and, and whether or not what they're doing is evil or not. But turn over to Romans 6, verse 20. Christ our Savior has to break that power and that dominion, that sin and Satan has over us by nature. Right? When we were, when, before we knew Christ, by nature we were under the, the power and the dominion of Satan so that he could just take us and use us at his own will. But Christ must come and deliver us out of that, that power. So in Romans 6.20, Paul says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were freed from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So that as we were laboring and working under the power of the flesh and under sin and of Satan, we did those things that we thought were right or didn't care if they were wrong. We just didn't care. They were spiritually dead. And so Christ comes along and he by his power and his grace and his spirit gives us life. He's the one that brings us out from that darkness and out from that dominion of sin and Satan. Paul goes on to ask in Romans 7, 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. So by nature, we were under the dominion of the law. But watch now. We'll see how that God himself takes us out from under that dominion and he brings us under, under the law of Christ. He brings us to Christ, our husband. So that Christ now is, we're married to Christ, and he bears fruit in us unto God. We couldn't do that in our own flesh. We were dead, and trespasses and sins, and we maybe labored and clawed and scratched to bring forth fruit, but we were unable to bring forth any fruit to be pleasing to God. In Romans 7, 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. If her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Right? So, by nature, either we had no regard for God, or we were religious, tried by the law to find to, to be pleasing and, and to make ourselves pleasing to God and to do those things that, that might be accepted of God our Father, but well, we couldn't bring forth anything. The best that we could do was bring forth stinking, rotten, dead fruit, because that's all that the flesh can produce. It can't produce anything that God will accept himself. But God in mercy had determined to save his people and leave them to themselves because we know by ourselves, by our own works, we can't please the Father. We can't undo what we've done. We can't clean ourselves up and make ourselves clean of the sin that we've committed against God. But God sent the Son, sent His own Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for the very purpose of putting away our sin, doing for us what we can never do for ourselves. So that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. He is the means of forgiveness that God has provided for his people. So that in Christ, when Christ walked the earth, he fulfilled all righteousness, he as our substitute fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf. And when he went to the cross, he bore our sins, and he bore us in him, so that when he died, we died that the law no longer has dominion over us. The law can say nothing more to us. We look to Christ, we're under the law of Christ. And the law looks at us and says, you're perfect now. There's nothing I can say to you. There's nothing more I can say to you. We're no longer married to the law. We're no longer under the dominion of the law. There's nothing more the law can say to us. It's been satisfied completely by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that now in Christ, we married to him, bring forth fruit unto God the Father, and he accepts it because he accepts his Son, Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now we are delivered from the law, that 
being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. So, we see now how God has provided the salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to, to our study here in, in 1 Peter 2, verse 4. He says, To whom come, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, so that we come to our Lord Jesus Christ, who has provided a better hope for us. We were hopeless under law, because we could do nothing to please God. We couldn't bring forth living fruit. All we brought forth was dead, corrupt fruit of this flesh. So that it pleased God that in time to send his son to make to bring him forth being born of a woman under the law to fulfill all the law on our behalf so that the law is now perfectly satisfied and it's been fulfilled in him and he being righteous we being in him are perfectly righteous before God our father now and he's pleased to send his spirit to dwell in us make us alive to the things of God so that we hear his voice, we see who the Lord is, we understand what we are by nature, so that we no longer have confidence in those things. And he teaches us, breaking us from all that, that filth and those grave clothes, and he takes us away from that, turning us more and more to see that everything that we need is provided for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rest in him, rest in him, rest in him. And that's why he sends us the gospel, that we might hear it, over and over and over again because that's what we need. That's where we're fed. It's on we are fed Christ. That's by whom we live. By whom we delight like to hear it and rejoice to hear in Him because that's in whom we have life. The Lord doesn't look to us for anything. Not the things we do or the things we don't do. He looks to the Son, Jesus Christ. And as He enables us to hear that and the rest of Him, we walk rejoicing in what he's done. And we stop having to look at our flesh and fight those things of the flesh, you know, look, looking to them, thinking about those things, because we're looking to Christ, and we're resting in him and delighting in him and what he's done. So, we need Christ, and the Lord's going to show us our need of him. Right? In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For whom God hath set forth to be, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. So our Lord brings us to the Savior to behold Him that He is sufficient for all our needs. He breaks us of that dead, dead letter religion, which is always looking back to self, right? When you were just dead in, in religion, you were always looking back to something that you could find some comfort in, right? Either the date that you gave your heart to Jesus, or remembering some verse that hit you with power in particular one special day, or some experience that you had. But dead religion never looks to Christ. It is never satisfied with Christ doesn't see Christ as all and sufficient. We see that they're still looking to the flesh, looking inwardly for something that they can fix their hope in. Because Christ just isn't tangible to the flesh. The carnal man can't receive the Lord Jesus Christ. But the child of grace will bow before God's salvation, and he's provided in the Son, and will give him all the glory and the praise for saving us, for having mercy on us, and doing everything make us accepted with God. All right. Now, how we come to Christ. And we'll look at three things here in how we come to Christ. First, in the second half of 1 Peter 2.4, uh, the second half where it says, we'll see that it's the Lord who brings us to Christ. We come to Christ because of the Lord's work. The second half says that Christ is disallowed in need of men, but chosen of God and precious. Second, we'll see that he continually brings us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We never stop coming to Christ. We never go beyond the Lord Jesus Christ. As he says there in the first half of verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone. 
And then third, we'll see how being coming to Christ and being taught of God, we come to Christ, we rest in Christ continually, looking to Him, and He causes us to live upon Christ and to grow in Him. Verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All right, so let's look at these three points, subpoints, a little more. First, we see that it's the Lord's doing that we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by God the Father doing this work that, that we come to Christ. Right? Christ is disallowed in need of men, but chosen of God and precious. So that the point here is that the child of God, they don't boast in what they've done for Jesus. The, the world boasts in their faith and how they believed in Christ and how all this opposition was against them and yet they trusted Christ and they believed in Christ and it's all about what they've done and they're looking to how tightly they're holding on to Christ and what they're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ because that's where they believe they are blessed that it's in their faith and in what they've produced and how well they're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So. When you hear someone talking about their faith and what they've done, they're a liar. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ because the child of God doesn't talk like that. God will, they may talk like that for a time, but God is going to break them of that and deliver them of that to see that, all right, it's not me. This isn't of me. Everything is of Christ. Everything I have is of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he'll bring his child to see even their very faith is the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in, and, and we see that it's it's not of us. Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. We see that it's God doing the work. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In darkness is where the Lord finds all his people. None of us can boast of having come out of the darkness and been standing in the light when God found us. You're either found in darkness or you're not found at all. None of us gets ourselves out of that darkness. The Lord Jesus Christ was sent into this world to save sinners, to save his people out of the darkness that we're in by nature. As Zechariah prophesied, of Christ in Luke chapter 1 verses 78 and 79 he said through the tender mercy of our God whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace so if you're not sitting in the shadow of darkness then you're never going to see Christ as Christ comes to sinners who are sitting in darkness he delivers his people out of darkness None for whom Christ died that are that got themselves out of the darkness first, that cleaned themselves up and made themselves so that they can be accepted of God. You're either saved completely of Christ or you're not saved at all. It's either by Christ, but never by your flesh. So men in darkness, though, they don't know or understand the depth of their darkness, the depth of the sin that, that they're in. We don't understand these things until the Lord reveals them us All right so we know people that 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 would hear us say these things and would still seek to justify themselves because they think that if they can convince you or themselves while they're convincing you that maybe everything is all right and they just don't want to let go and accept the fact that they are wickedness and, and unable to save themselves and Christ warns us faithfully not to trust in what we know, not to trust in our works, not to trust in our flesh, how well we can convince ourselves or another that we're his. He said in Luke 11 35, take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Because by nature, so often we presume that we know the Lord. We just assume that because we go to church or pick up our Bible once in a while or quote a few verses, even if we do it a lot, and even if we're, we're faithful in saying prayers every morning or at night that 
somehow this must be a clue that we're the Lord's. But that's just trusting in those things. It's not trusting what Christ is. The Lord tells us what Christ has accomplished, that he put away our sin by the death of himself. And the child of God hears that. They delight, they rest in. When they look at themselves, they may see a lot of things that they don't like or think, think this shouldn't even be with me, that this shouldn't be part of me. And it shouldn't. Right? We, we shouldn't have sin. We shouldn't do those things. But the reality is, we do. We live in this flesh. We do have lusts and sins and darkness and all manner of things. So none of us can look at that, at our own flesh and what we're doing or not doing to gain any comfort. Because that's not the salvation. That's not life. That's not the bread of life. Christ himself is the bread of life. Are you looking to the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, in his blood, what he did for his people. Are you, did you hear that? Do you trust that Christ has put away your sin? Just as the Lord says, Christ was sent to the world to put away the sin of his people. So in spite of what you see in yourself, you're not looking to that to find comfort. You're looking to the Lord. Rest right there what Christ has done. John 1, 4 and 5 declares to us, in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, in, in religion, we're taught so often to look inside, right, to examine our feelings, or to look at our fruit, and to compare with our fruits better than another, but that's not looking to Christ. That's not a Christian. That's not, that's not like being, well, I guess they would say it's being a Christian, but that's not how Doing. We're not measuring ourselves and how well we did as opposed to yesterday or anything like that. All of that is darkness, and it's just that our dark natural heart trying to find something whereby we can comfort ourselves and feel that we're comforted and that we are the Lord's. But again, we find our comfort, find our peace, trusting what the Lord has said concerning His Son, Jesus Christ. And I don't mean it by knowledge. He gives us a spirit. He'll teach us, but we continually look to Christ, resting there in what he's done, even when our feelings tell us, I don't feel like a Christian. And if I was the Lord's, I wouldn't do what I just did there. We'll do that to ourselves all the time. And that's why it's not a, that's not a stable place. That's just sand that, that we're standing on now. Our Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. So, the natural man is never going to understand it. The natural man is never going to understand that Christ is all, that Christ is everything. He said in John 3, This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are brought in God. Right? So we must be taken out of that kingdom of darkness, out of that, that blindness to, to, to looking from looking to ourselves, to looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul said to the Colossians in 112, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins so that we always see salvation as as a work accomplished it's done in the lord jesus christ it's not anything left for us to finish or complete we connect the dots to bring it together christ has done all the work and so we continually just hear what Christ has done, right? We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And thereby is how the Lord heals his people. He instructs us, he teaches them, yes, he convinces us this in the heart. So that looking to him, he washes away the guilt, he washes away the sin, and he'll, by his spirit, will walk in looking to him. And these, these other corrupt things of the flesh, He'll, he'll turn our desires and our heart 
from longing after the things of the world and sets them on Christ. That we see how unprofitable we are when we sin. We see how, you know, once once we sin, our mind is on the guilt and the corruption that's in our flesh, and now we see I'm not even able to serve my brethren. That's all I'm thinking about is what a wicked man I am. You know, and then, and then we're unprofitable. So it's not that we're doing those things to save ourselves, but because we don't want to walk in that way. Our Lord turns us from that. And we want to be prompted. We want our hearts and our minds to be set on Christ because that's when we're free, not worrying about looking to the things of the flesh. And we're thinking about Christ and how we might be able to serve our brethren, be a help to them rather than just thinking of ourselves. Paul told the Ephesians in 5 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You must keep looking to the Lord, and He'll help you. He'll enable you to walk as children of light. That doesn't mean you're perfect and without sin, and we certainly never look back to the law to help us walk as children of light. That's the, the quickest way to get back to being a child of darkness, because that's when you're going to resort to those works of the flesh. That's when you can resort to being tricky and crafty and hiding your sin and, and you know, being used of God and, and hypocrisy and malice and things like that. That's, the law is just going to lead you right back to the works of the flesh. We look to Christ resting that he's done the work and when we sin, we confess it to the Lord. We ask him for forgiveness and, and we rest right there in him, trusting him. Right, uh, 1 John 1, 6-9 says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So together we're walking in light with one another because we're confessing in my flesh. I'm a, a wild, dead dog sinner. There's nothing good in me. I'm not hiding that from you and you're not hiding it from me. We're all here confessing we are sinners in need of the grace that God has provided in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we're walking in that light together because that's what God has shown us. The law has pronounced us guilty nothing good in me, nothing good in you, we're trusting in the Lord. And so that's how we're, we're walking in life, and we're joined with one another in that confession, and in that, that belief that, yep, um, there's nothing good in me, but my hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not walking in darkness. Walking in darkness is saying, well, I'm a little better today than I was yesterday. No, you're not. You're, you know, I'm not. You're, you're not. But that's just, that's lying. That's walking in darkness continuing that charade you know, of, of religion, that somehow we're, we're better, and that's why God accepts us. Now, second, he brings us continually to Christ. We never stop coming to Christ. We never graduate or go above or beyond the Lord Jesus Christ. We always need the Lord Jesus Christ. As Peter said, to whom come, or come, continually come. We haven't came once. Christ came once. And he put away our sin once and for all. We are redeemed. But we continually come to Christ. We never stop coming to him as unto a living stone. So that Christ is the believer's life. Just as you make sure that every day you have food, water, you have shelter, and you take your, your diligent about those things and providing those things for your family because they're ne necessary, so we are to be diligent about ensuring that we're looking to the Lord, that we're spending time seeking the Lord. There's a great benefit in seeking the Lord, in, in, in praying, and seeking the Lord for these things. He says, I will be sought and sought of by the house of Israel for these things. We have many things. You know, there, there's things in, in your hearts about what the Lord's doing here. So don't just assume, well, you know, it's the Lord's will, or something's going to happen. It, that's true. If it is the Lord's will, something will happen, but he's going to lay it on our hearts care and to think about it and to pray about it and, and to seek to to see the Lord's work established here. We're not going to be lazy or indifferent to it. Just assuming, well, that's God's work, but him 
figure it out. He's going to give us a heart for those things. You know, and I could see it to a certain degree, you know, when I was, when I sold my house and moving down here, with everything in the truck, and my dad's in the truck with me, you know, my wife and my daughter are back up there in New Jersey still for a couple days. And I'm coming down here, I was okay, even though I was not you know, without shelter and I didn't necessarily know when I was going to eat or, or whatnot. But I was okay because there was a, an end result I could see it coming. But then in the middle of the trip, I spoke to uh, my realtor and found out that the funding still hadn't gone through. So my house was sold up there, my house down here was not really closed all the way. And I'm driving down here and I can immediately, you know, I can immediately feel in me a sense of, am I even going to be able to get in the house? What am I going to do? You know, and, and immediately that instability hits, and that anxiousness hits, and everything falls apart. And it's a good thing for us to be reminded because everything always seems to be going well, doesn't it? Until suddenly it isn't. And all of a sudden it just, the floor falls out from beneath you, and you're in this whirlwind, and you're, you're thinking everything was so good, and I was going on my happy little merry way, and suddenly everything fell apart. And then immediately you begin to scramble and think, oh, I haven't been reading my Bible or praying much. You know, you, you go to those in, um, Arminian type thoughts, you know, what we should be doing. But the Lord does show us that we never know when the catastrophe is going to hit. We don't know what's going to happen to us later today at all. And that's why we continually feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're never more stable or more prepared for the catastrophe or the calamity that hits than when you're looking to the Lord. And He's the one that's going to help through it. He's the one that's going to comfort you in it and, and keep you looking to Him. And, and I don't wish calamity on, on any of us you know, at all. Um, but the Lord will use, you know, He'll, he'll be with His people he'll teach his people and comfort his people. So what better place than to always be looking to the Lord so that when it hits, we're always ready to give an answer to the reason and the hope that's within us to whoever it is that asks us those things. So, you know, we, we always want to be looking to the Lord and, and never like, you know, like this, this world, right? That seems to be fine without Christ. We come to services on Sunday, and then right after our services, they go and they just forget the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done for His people and what He's done for them. We always want to be, you know, like, like the apostles where Christ said to them, Will you also go away and pray to have that spirit like Peter? He said, Lord, whom shall we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. We are assured that you're the Son of God, that you are. That the Lamb of God has not even provided. Where are we going to go? And let us always have that spirit to never trust in ourselves or think of ourselves as something. So Christ is our living bread, right? He says, I am bread of heaven. We continually feed upon him. All right, third, we come being taught of God so that we live and grow up in Christ. 1 Peter 2 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So that the, the beauty in this point is that we see that Christ has given us everything that we need. If you remember, he said to the, the woman in Samaria, he said, God is a spirit. Men that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we see how Christ, in 1 Peter even, how the Lord has given us a new birth. He's given us uh, life in himself so that we now are that spiritual house. We're built up in Christ, being made a spiritual house, being made lively stones or living stones in that spiritual house so that we offer up spiritual sacrifices. That is, we stop offering up the works of the flesh and trusting in them, and we're just coming the blood of Christ, because that's that spiritual sacrifice that God accepts. That's who, 
in whom we come to God accepted of him in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the one that, that makes us acceptable to God. So we see that there to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ there in 1 Peter 2, 5. That's all coming to the Lord in Christ Jesus. Our, the, the one sacrifice that, that God the Father accepts and receives is the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't come in our own works, trusting in what we desire. Cease coming to God and trusting in Him in those things. And He teaches us that. He shows us that Christ is sufficient. And that becomes our confession. And that continually is our only confession. It's not talking about us. We just talk about what Christ has accomplished that. He has redeemed us. He has put away our sins. So, ask yourself, is Christ precious to you? Is Christ precious to you? He's precious to the Father. That's what God himself said. He's disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. God counts Christ precious. And he's precious to the child of God because we know that that's the only ground upon which God accepts us. He only receives us in his son, Jesus Christ. When you know what a sinner you are, you know that you desperately need peace with God. And the only way he's going to have peace with you is in the son, Jesus Christ. That's where he'll meet with his people. It's in the blood. The blood of the son, Jesus Christ. That's when Christ becomes precious to you. You stop counting it just a, a component of your salvation, let alone a, a, worthless, a worthless thing. So Christ is made precious to us. He's our life. He's our all. To whom coming continue. So uh, let me just close. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, he also as lively stones, built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This is by Christ that God accepts us and receives us. Let's close with prayer. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for providing your son Jesus Christ. Lord, make him precious to us. Help us to see that we have no ground to stand up before you, but Christ alone. Lord, cover us with his blood. Give us his spirit. Make us alive to our Lord and our God. In Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. Amen.